What up, nerds? What up, nerds? It's me, John Compton. Um, I'll be running tonight's uh, interactive stargazing. Uh, so we've got some like water nebulas up there blocking our view. Um, humidity is a little bit high, so we're gonna go through some like greatest hits. Uh, I've got some fun pictures from the mountain camp pulled up. Uh, and yeah, I'm just gonna answer fun questions. I'll tell you some mythology. Uh, I'll point out my favorite objects and why I like them so much, uh, and just kind of hang out for the next hour. So please uh, hit me up with questions um, or corrections. If you've listened to the Star Stuff podcast here at Lowell, you might have heard me a couple times um, begging for people to, to uh, um actually me in the comments and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's hang out and have some fun. Um, so I'll kind of wait for everyone to get get kind of settled in the discord settled with the youtube and kind of hang out for a minute um you can see i've got a a beautiful object pulled up right now um this is one of my one of my favorites um this is a m15 uh it's a you know it's a globular star cluster out in pegasus it does not have a name it's just the 15th messier object uh it's in pegasus and it's coming like off off the head of Pegasus. Um, actually, I can pull it up in Stellarium for you. In two shakes of Ursa Major's tail. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we're looking. We're looking out here in Pegasus. So um, the story of Pegasus, realistically. Um, is uh, the story of a Gorgon, right? Or a lady that gets turned into a Gorgon um, by vengeful gods and ends up getting her, her head. Um, and what pops forth from this woman is uh, Pegasus, right? So Pegasus means to spring forth. Um, and so the object we're looking at is kind of right around, right off the tip of his, of his snoot. Um, so let's pop that back up. Yeah, so M15 is right off the tip of Pegasus's snoot. You can still see it in the little tiny window. Uh, I like it. It doesn't have a name. I feel like it should be called the Fountain Cluster. So, um, you know, let's get at that. Uh, it's it's a beautiful little little sparkle of stars um, coming off of the, the head of the winged horse uh, that, you know, sprang forth. So, yeah, Fountain Cluster kind of, kind of fits, kind of makes sense. It's fun. Um, I like it a lot because one, it's a globular cluster, right? And globular clusters are cool to me. Um, they, uh, you know, they can form in a, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the one I like the best <clears throat> is that they're the core of a galaxy that's been cannibalized by the Milky Way long ago, which is rad. So it's like the last remnant of when Milky Way merged with some other galaxy, some tinier galaxy a long, long time ago. And because of that, they've got these uh, cool, they have like some really interesting properties. And so this one in particular is fun. Um, you can actually probably see it with your naked eye on a good night, um, but even with like a pair of sort of okay binoculars or whatever, you can go out there and, and see a little blurry patch in the night sky, um, which is why it's one of the Messier objects because the Messier stuff is all just blurry things. Uh, that Messier didn't want to accidentally find again because they were caught, you know, he was looking for comets. Uh, but um, look out at this little blurry object uh, and see the, the remnants of a galaxy that was long incorporated into the Milky Way. Uh, and this one's interesting because you can see the little bright patch at the center. Most of these globular clusters have somewhat of a bright patch. Um, and it's because they're sort of, you know, the stable object that kind of orbits around uh, the galaxy as if the galaxy were a star or something and they were a planet. So you imagine you've got like the plane of the Milky Way and a lot of times they orbit at like really weird angles um, and they sort of preserve the angle that they were originally uh, sort of like incorporated in. This one is cool. Uh, a lot of people, well, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it has an intermediate sized black hole at the center of it, which is cool. Um, it's like on the on the fence about like whether or not it's gonna uh, spaghettify you or trap you in time first. So that's kind of rad. Um, but it's just a, a really really beautiful cluster. It's, it's pretty far away, um, like in the thousands, tens of thousands of light years away. Uh, but I mean, 
It makes sense. It used to be a galaxy or the core of a galaxy. And now it's just hanging out with us, hanging out with us tonight. Um, something I would say probably 100,000 plus stars in there. Uh, I'm not great on distances and the numbers. So if you ask me questions that are like, how far away is this thing? Usually my answer is going to be, um, well, I can't touch it when I reach out at the night sky. So it's got to be over seven or eight feet away. Um, so I will say uh, very accurately that this object is over 10 feet away from Earth. Um, uh, not precise, but definitely accurate. Uh, but yeah, I'm drinking my uh, Keep Up All Night coffee with the Lowell, Lowell logo. Um, yeah, so uh, M13 or M15, beautiful. Needs a good name. Uh, please put your name suggestions in the in the in the Discord. Let me know what you think. Um, I I'm partial to Fountain Cluster, uh, but um, yeah, name it what you will. Um, yeah. So one of the questions is: uh, Are all the objects taken from the telescopes at Lowell? All the objects I'm going to show were taken with the Malincam at one point or another. Um, I don't think any of the ones I have. Uh, kind of lined up are ones that um, have I, I know who took them right so I can't I can't cite them which would be fun but they were all taken with the Malin cam which is what we would normally use for interactive stargazing um, it's just one of the big uh, camera systems set up on a telescope outside uh, which if you're ever up at Lowell Observatory is super fun to watch you can watch them take the images uh, live you can watch them like fiddle with the settings and things it's cool um, so you can look at look at objects with your naked eye, and then also look at ones that we're taking um, on the fly, high res. Uh, are there any uh, recent photos of Saturn that were taken while it's been at its closest to Earth? I, I don't think I have any through the Malin cam, um, but I'm not sure. Um, oh, we've got some. Um, we can grab them for you. Yeah. Seems like we've got some some that have been taken. Uh, another comment is the globular cluster looks like a Fourth of July sparkler. It does. Um, it's got that really really yellow color to it. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, like you're waving it around. So it's this the sparkler sparkler cluster. Uh, let's get some cool ones based on the idea that it may or may not have a cool black hole at the center of it. Um, cannonball cluster comes to mind. Uh, I don't know. Have fun with it. Yeah, so I, um, looks like we do have a cool, oh, uh, uh, let me see how to grab this. Sorry, everyone, I'm a bit stupid. Let's see. I will figure out how to make this work and I'll show you this picture, but not right now. Um, sorry, let's, do I know how to do it? That's the big question. Yeah, I don't. My my producer is currently trying to trying to tell me how to do tech things. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So by the end by the end we'll definitely try and find some some images of Saturn for you uh, that we've taken recently. So yeah, Saturn's in opposition, um, or you know around opposition. Opposition is just a sort of a, a tiny little snippet in time. It's like saying where the border of a thing is. It's, it's kind of an infinitely small period. But uh, so like you could miss it by a bunch and it still looks cool. So yeah, go check out Saturn. Um, I've said in um, sort of podcasts before, now's the time. Gas prices are high, y'all. Um, if you're going to get to Saturn, uh, get to it when it's closest. Get, get to when it's as close to Earth as it can get, which is right now. Um, short little drive, you know, uh, hang out, check out some rings. Uh, I hear the um, Italian ice is delicious. Um, I'm partial to the marshmallow or lemon, but you know, um, yeah. So, let's see, I'm being told that I've been sent it via email. Let's take a peek. Yeah, so um, some beautiful images of Saturn. Jupiter's also looking pretty nice these days. Um, I think Saturn is, is probably going to be somewhere in um, K2 
Capricorn, I think, right now. Jupiter's not too far off. Okay. All right. I got some pictures now. Let's see what we can do. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, nope. I'm going to have to fiddle with some settings. <laughs> Thank you for um, Ursa majoring with me. swear to you um, I'll get it by the end um, maybe if we take a, like a little there's like a little downtime um, yeah Saturn has some cool news or some cool moons um, Saturn and Jupiter both have really really cool moons I feel like it's it's due to the fact that they should have become stars they were both failed stars and so all of the uh, you know all the moons would have been really cool planets around these these stars but there just wasn't enough um, stellar fuel to go around, right? There wasn't enough uh, hydrogen. Uh, let's see. Um, in my professional, I wouldn't go that far. In my in my professional equipment, which is better, the Milky Way or the Milky Way candy bar? Oh, the Milky Way is b b leaps, leaps better. Um, caramel, not a fan of it when it's combined with nougat. Uh, it's, just, it's just weird. I don't know. I don't like the, the contrast and texture, but the Milky Way... Uh, our galaxy, our home, beautiful, beautiful um, cloudy streak across the sky, right? Uh, to the north, this was the Bifrost um, in old, like, Gaelic lore. Uh, the Milky Way was literally a stream of milk coming from a giant cow. And um, at the end of it, uh, in Scorpius, which I can, I guess I can show you. Um, so if you go and you look at Scorpius, out here, which is up. Um, Scorpius, you're totally mad. Uh, I guess Scorpius has set. But um, Scorpius is like down here below Sag. Uh, and um, it was supposed to be in, in like Gaelic lore, right? It was this uh, water snake, a two headed water snake. And it was trying to basically like swim up the Milky Way and then uh, basically bite this big cow. Uh, and it was sort of like, it's similar in Norse mythology, how you sort of there was a, a cow that started the universe and things like that. Kind of kind of similar, but this big, great cow. And uh, it wanted a bite of that cow. Uh, but but the, um, the cow like, kind of uh, shot out the milk too fast. So it was like trying to quickly swim up the river, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, we can see actually in Stellarium right now, uh, this constellation in the center with Deneb at the tail is Cygnus the Swan, right? And um, that was usually represented by a um, <clears throat> uh, sort of this Gaelic hero called Lou. And um, in sort of old uh, like Celtic mythology, when you've got like a, a hero or, or a king or a great Thing. They called them dragons, right? And not like a mythical dragon, but like that was just the name for someone that was awesome. Um, and so uh, Cygnus here was one of those dragons, um, a dude by the name of Lou, uh, and um, supposedly protecting the great cow from uh, this chompy little snake, chompy little water snake. Um, some other questions we got. Uh, do <laughs> Do Jupiter and Saturn need Mylanta because they're gas giants? Yes, desperately. Uh, so you, please make that delivery. If anyone wants to 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 pay for like the delivery service, we could, we could totally do it. We get them out there, bam, um, make them feel so much better. I don't know what they'd collapse into if we got rid of all the gas. There's, I'm trying to think of what's actually at the center. I think it's just dense, more gas. I think when you if you were to remove like the gravitational pressure from all the gas on the gas giants, 
whatever's in the center would decompress and there'd just be more and more gas. Um, let's see. Oh, um, we shared the photo of Saturn uh, via a link to the Instagram. Um, so you can check it out there because I don't know how to get it on this, on this live stream. Um, sorry y'all. Uh, my producer over here is, um, figuring out how to post it and stuff. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, Bjorning with me, Ursa majoring with me. Um, yeah, the, the, it looks like the moons are kind of, uh, not super in view right here. Um, but yeah, or at least in the Saturn picture that I'm kind of looking at from the Instagram feed. So hmm. let's look at some more of John's favorite objects. Uh, and then ask me about things that you enjoy. Again, I'll talk about whatever. Um, but, oh, the Milky Way, the Bifrost, right? Um, it's the, the connection uh, between the different realms in Norse mythology. So there's a lot of, you can, you can track a lot about how different cultures interacted um, when it comes to uh, how their constellation stories kind of mix together. Um, because those are sort of the stories you told around a campfire with your pals. And when you met new people and you, you broke bread and you hung out, you would tell them your fun stories too. And so a lot of them get mixed up in weird ways. Um, oh, weird. Okay, so um, uh, in, uh, I guess someone in the Discord is, is pointing out, oh, it's from Mr. A. Hey. Um, that uh, there's there's like another mythology or another um, religion about the the starting of the universe with um, churning of milk uh, using a snake, which is cool. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot a lot of cow stuff in um, a lot of these constellation stories that aren't necessarily like the, the Greek and Roman ones. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the great cow in Norse mythology, but it um, it licked uh, the ice until it basically carved the gods, I think. And then they sort of came, so it carved them by just like uh, licking them out of some ice, which is cool. It was a great being, um, was it Emir and a big old cow. That's cool. Um, the cow that sort of like foretold the end of the world. Uh, I'm trying to think. I can't think of many other myths involving cows. Um, obviously Taurus, the bull. I don't know if that counts, um, because that was mostly just Zeus in disguise, um, trying to get up to no good. Let's see. Let's take a little peek at another cluster that I very much enjoy while I uh, see some more comments coming through. Um, yeah, so this one is M13. This one does have a name, but we can rename it. Who's to say? Uh, we, can, we can do whatever we want. Edit that Wikipedia. Um, M13 is the great cluster in Hercules, though. Uh, I really like it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, this is a cluster, well, you can see, uh, st Stellarium kind of in the, like, above my head right now. So I'm going to show you where, where Hercules is. Uh, it's just the great cluster in Hercules. Uh, where's Draco? I always find it based on, it looks like he's stepping on Draco's head. Uh, so this is this is Hercules right here, this little spindly boy. Um, <clears throat> he's gone through a lot of iterations and a lot of different constellation stories. Oh, there's another one. Um, uh, Hathor in Egypt, the cow goddess. That's cool. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, just hanging out. Um, M95, solid choice. Uh, yeah, but so um, I like this cluster. It is a great cluster in Hercules. It's um, basically right around here near his side. Uh, oh, I can't see my pointer. It's it's by his like lower side, right? Like if you were to look right, right, right there, right there, near his side, um, there's a bright, a bright uh, fuzzy patch. And actually, if you go out on a clear night, you can see it with your naked eye. It looks great, just like a little furry patch. Um, if you see if you uh, pull up uh, with some binoculars or monocular or whatever, you can see it pretty well. Uh, the reason I like this one um, is because, so Hercules, the constellation itself, has gone through a lot of a lot of iterations, right? Um, it's been known as the Kneeling Man. 
Um, it's been associated with um, Hercules stealing uh, the apple, the golden apples, uh, and running off. Where um, uh, Corona Borealis here, uh, you see the Northern Crown has been associated with um, a basket of apples. Oh, you can see my little pointer. A basket of apples. And Boades down here, which you can't really see, um, has been associated with Atlas sometimes. So, uh, but Hercules up here, uh, besides the kneeling man and besides Hercules, it's also been associated with Prometheus um, from mythology and specifically Prometheus bound. So if you uh, if you see the little his little limbs, I'll pull it up on. Might as well pull it up on a big screen for you now and show it a little bit easier. Um, but if you look at uh, like this part here and kind of this part and these duders <clears throat> and this little guy, these are meant to be like his, um, he's being Prometheus is bound to the rock as punishment for giving fire to the people when they weren't supposed to have it because he kind of felt bad for him. He felt bad for humans because we were living in muck and in darkness. And so he gave us fire. He stole fire from the gods and gave it to us. And the gods got mad. And so they um, chained him to a rock or chained him to a mountain. And then a, uh, an eagle, which sometimes is associated with a kill of the eagle over here. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, this is Altair, um, the eagle. So you can see, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, this is a kill of the eagle. Altair is sometimes shown as its head, but I don't think that looks right. I, I like to think of Altair as its tail and then its head kind of goes down and swooping around and avoiding the Milky Way. But this this eagle, um, yeah, uh, the eagle eagle would um, basically, uh, we, we got to keep it PG, y'all. Um, it would uh, smooch out his liver uh, every day and it would regenerate. Mm. Um, now, I like this because the cluster is like right there, right where... I mean, a liver wouldn't be there. That's kind of high for a liver, but it, it feels cool. Like a little burst of a little globular liver cluster kind of popping out of his side right there. I mean, that's, that's neat. Um, and it's interesting. So uh, M13, the great cluster in Hercules, was, is, well, was the one, I guess, is, was, help me with the tense. Um, there is currently a radio broadcast being sent there. Uh, and it's the Arecibo message. So if you've ever seen it, it's real weird and it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, but it's a radio broadcast that we sent out there hoping to talk to extraterrestrial life. Um, it's a long, long journey away. But um, it's a cool one. We sent them like a picture. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a little, what do you call it? Uh, pixel art of people and DNA and um, all kinds of stuff. And so it's like we're trying to talk. We're, we're hoping to find life that's more advanced than us there because these stars are really old and there's plenty of them. And um, it's one tiny spot. So the idea was if we couldn't aim that well, we're going to hit some of them with the radio broadcast. And maybe one of them will send us a message back and give us the fire of the gods, um, a.k.a. warp drive technology. Uh, and, then, and then we'll have it. And we can zoom out there and explore the stars. Um, it's neat. So I think it's interesting that the constellation associated with Prometheus, one, has a busted liver. Two, uh, is where we send messages trying to talk to those that are more advanced and gain the power of their um, warp drive uh, fire. And it's neat. Um, so I'll, I'll pop, pop the picture of it back up. You can see they're really icy blue stars, which is fun. Um, icy blue meaning that they're, you know, uh, hot, hot, hot stars. So, yeah, let's take a little peek at that one last time, and then um, please marvel at its glory uh, while I look, answer some more questions and things like that. Um, how is how is Beetle just doing? I uh, hear it's a bit explosive at the moment. You know that's right. Um, who's to say when it's gonna go? You know. Uh, it could be any day now. It could be right now. Take a peek. Maybe it's exploded already. Uh, we'll know. It'll, it'll be like as bright as the moon when it when it goes, when it pops finally. Um, same thing happened with the Crab Nebula, which is in Taurus a long time ago. Um, it basically, you know, star goes, uh, and it makes a 
big bright flash, right? And um, uh, we, we were able to calibrate calendars, ancient calendars, um, based on, because there, there were calendars where we didn't really have a Rosetta Stone for them, where it's like, well, we know that this is an ancient calendar, but we don't know like what dates line up with what. And um, so some of them were able to use uh, the, basically the uh, nebuliz nebulization, I guess, of um, the nebulization of the star, right, in that now has become Crab Nebula. Uh, when, you know, they looked, they basically, everyone wrote in their calendars like, Ah, what's happening? Ah, what's that in the sky? Ah, there's a star and now there's a big bright cloud and it's it, it's going crazy. Um, and so they just used that to pinpoint the calendar. So now they could line up the date when everyone wrote in their calendar. Ah, ah, what's going on? I'm so scared. What's that in the sky? Um, with the day we know that the crab, or with the time period kind of roughly that we knew that the crab nebula went, which is cool. Um, it would be like as bright as the full moon in the night sky. So if Beetlejuice goes, oh, you'll know it. Plus, it would make a ton of news. Um, probably get some weird alert on your phone from people freaking out. Uh, so I, I always thought a fun joke. Um, if you have access to a telescope where you can reprogram the coordinates for different stars, like to update them, a fun April Fool's joke would be to um, reprogram uh, Beetlejuice to be for Crab Nebula. So when someone points it at it, uh, they'll see a big old uh, detonated star cloud. Uh, and you could be like, oh no, it went. I heard, oh, I heard, I heard Beetlejuice is going to go any day now. Why don't you point it at Beetlejuice? And they'll, they'll, you know, slew the scope over and they'll be like, ah, it's a cloud. It's, it went. I don't know. I think it would be fun. Um, uh, birds pecked out his eyes? Maybe. Ew. Gross. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think they'd both be pretty bad, right? Like, the, the alga versus the the liver. Mm -mm. No good. Birds are creepy anyway. Weird dinosaurs. Um, uh, <laughs> um, is uh, Vesta pestering Saturn at the moment? Um, I don't really know what Saturn's doing, to be honest. Um, oh, what are we looking at? Uh, we're currently looking at... Um, the Great Cluster in Hercules, the 13th Messier object. I'm just telling some lore about it, about um, Hercules, about Prometheus, about all my fun things. Um, how about Eagle Nebula? Well, I've got I've got like a little curated list of my favorites. Uh, I can try and pull up some other ones, um, but I'll, I'll pop some other stuff up. Uh, give me a second. So maybe I'll get through the ones that I've kind of like prepped and I'm excited about. And then we'll do the ones that you're excited about. And it'll be great. Um, I just have to pull open a folder and find them. Uh, let's see. Can I pull up an image of Comet K2? Maybe. Maybe I'll look for it. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. So I guess before everyone riots against me, I'll pull up another fun object. Mm -mm -mm. So, um, speaking of exploding stars, this is the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, this is uh, in, well, it's near Cygnus. I believe it's in Vopecula. Um, it's going to be right around this region. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Yeah, it's going to be be right off of, oh wait, Dumbo. Yeah, it's gonna be right off of Cygnus. I usually find it by finding kind of the cross of, of Cygnus and then uh, making a rectangle with it and going away from Lyra, which is right over there with Vega as the main star in it. Um, but Dumbbell's cool. Uh, it's a star that, that done died. Um, so this is kind of what happens when a, when a star dies. It's very beautiful. Um, you can see all the, the different colors of it, uh, and those are the different gases that kind of come off um, when a star dies, right? They get to a certain point where they can no longer fuse anything, and then they go, right? And those elements kind of travel around the universe slowly and um, drift into other regions of space and do things. So um, a lot of times what's left, especially this type of what's called planetary nebula, because they thought it was a planet forming back in the day, and we never updated the name. Uh, we can we can update Pluto's planetary designation, but we can't update planetary nebula. 
whatever. Um, it does look like an apple core, right? Uh, it's very, they're very beautiful. Um, but the, the different colors you're seeing are the different gases, the, the different elements that kind of come off from this um, type of event, type of, um, yeah. So when a star can no longer fuse anything, it kind of goes through a couple of reactions, it kind of gets bigger, it expands, and then it collapses. And then sometimes uh, if, well, yeah, sometimes it collapses again and goes boom, right? And what's left is the core of that star. Uh, and that, that hyperheated core made of pure carbon is um, a white dwarf. It looks like Darth Vader's TIE fighter. Kind of does, yeah. I see it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool little smudge, cool little fun smudge. Um, but it's a, it's a star that died. It, it basically exploded out in the universe. Um, yeah. And so those gases then are gonna are gonna go fly off, right? And that white dwarf that's left over, um, right now is illuminating all of the gases. But eventually they'll drift off, and you won't see them anymore. And they'll they'll join some other nebulous region, maybe an H two region, maybe a stellar nursery, maybe a new star that's born. Um, we'll have some of those elements incorporated in it. Uh, yeah, I think. Um, uh, Dulcimerist, I, I'm pretty sure, right? I think the red is the hydrogen and the blue is probably, probably oxygen. And then we're left with carbon at the center is kind of the last thing that could form in this type of one. So, um, yeah, you just sort of fuse heavier and heavier elements until it just can't. It runs out of runs out of the energy available to do it. And then you get a big old shock wave from when it collapses due to gravity, which is cool. Um, you know, you talk about, like, the bow shock of a solar system. So I think, I think our solar system... Um, the, the sole solar system is about a light year across when you get to sort of the, um, what's considered the bow shock, which I think the bow shock theory in general for these sorts of things was, uh, sort of like proven wrong. I think I read a paper about it recently, but, uh, it's still nice to think about like, what's the edge of our, of our solar system. Yeah. It's about a light year across. Um, so like past the Oort cloud. Uh, there's this region where um, the energy from the sun can no longer push away other um, parts of the, like the interstellar medium and things. And so uh, they consider that the, the bubble right, of the universe. So, or not the universe, <laughs> the bubble of the solar system. And so um, this is kind of like where it starts to hit that size and things and then really drifts out. Um, but if you want to look at the so this is what it would look like from the top down, right? We saw the apple core. Well, that apple core is kind of like a tube. Um, and uh, ring nebulae here, which is just a little bit further over near Vega, um, or near Vega in Lyra, uh, is sort of like what you, what you would see. I believe you can see the white dwarf at the center and then another star kind of in the background. Um, in this view, but you can definitely see the elements kind of on the outer edges, like that red and that gold, but definitely tons and tons of blue near the center. And you can see kind of that blast going out. Obviously this one's a little bit, a little bit tinier, you know, uh, in, in comparison, but I think it's, it's, um, it's really beautiful. It's, a, um, it does look like someone blew a little smoke ring, a little, a, well, little, uh, an enormous, um, <laughs> an, an, unfathomably enormous smoke ring or elemental ring. Um, but I do think it's fun, you know, so we're looking at Lyra here. Actually, I'm gonna pull up. Why not? So um, this is the constellation of Lyra. Um, you can see, so Vega there is, so we're kind of looking at it sort of sideways in my opinion, but um, Vega and that other star above it, like if you look above the V, those are sort of the tuning pegs of this this harp guitar kind of thing. Uh, and then you imagine sort of the body of it. And then, um, you know, if you can kind of like really trick yourself, you can maybe see some strings kind of kind of going down. And it's the story of Orpheus. So up here in Flagstaff and a bunch of other places, there are Orpheum theaters that were basically named for the guy that this story is about. Uh, he was um, basically, it's a tale as old as time, you know, he was able to hypnotize people and gods and, and um, things like that with his musical instrument um, because it was 
well, he found it after Mercury just kind of like left it on a beach. So Mercury, being mercurial as always, um, built a cool thing and just like left it there. And, um, you know, Mercury and Hermes were gods, were like messenger gods, but also gods of like trade and things like that. And um, so, so this musical instrument could kind of... Uh, it's basically used as a bargaining chip was the idea for trade. So like um, you could you could like play it, you could play it, and then uh, you know say like you're gonna buy this at a premium and people would. So uh, he finds it and he basically um, his wife had passed and he was trying to uh, venture into the underworld to go get her back and he used his uh, this instrument to hypnotize um, uh, the god of the underworld Pluto right. And uh, get his wife back. It it went poorly uh, for reasons, and um, uh, Hades basically grabbed the instrument and hooked it up into the night sky. And when um, you know, in, in Greek and Roman mythology, when something would touch the night sky, it would turn into the stars, and that was called the catasterism. Uh, and so the catasterism for for Orpheus for Orpheus' story is the catasterism of his lyra. Um, which got hooked in the night sky so we couldn't get it back and hypnotize Hades again and go to the underworld because, uh, you know, you're not supposed to, like, pull people out of there. And Hades got mad. Uh, yeah, so uh, Cat's Eye Nebula and Ring Nebula look, look, look pretty similar. They're, they're both planetary nebulas, of, and they're both, you know, things that have done gone wrong. Um, but they're, they're beautiful. So um, I think this is interesting that the Ring Nebula and is in... Uh, a story about a musical instrument, like the ringing uh, of of the notes and things like that, coming from sort of the the base of the um, uh, the guitar or the lyra or the harp or whatever. Um, nobody nobody mentions Dwarf Planet series. I love series too. I'm a big fan of series. And you know, series was a planet for a long, long time, and then it was demoted. But no one cares about series. No one talks about series these days. Um, yeah. My planetary symbol for Ceres right there um, on my arm, made to look kind of like a like an anchor tattoo. But um, yeah, Ceres, Pallas, all those, you know, they were planets out there in the in the main belt, and they were demoted. So I always thought it'd be funny to have, um, you know, like a, a, a picture of, of a bunch of people, like a Norman Rockwell type type picture of like a little family inside with a little fireplace gathered around Pluto and Pluto's kind of like got a little tear and like I used to be a planet and I'm not and they're all like we love you Pluto we love you and then in the background have like a window and just have like Ceres and Pallas peering in like what about us um you know yeah uh, everyone's Pluto Pluto should be a planet um but no one ever talks about Ceres um anyway you got me on a rant uh yeah it's cool Ceres is awesome Okay, that was my rant. Rant over. Um, so I like I like uh, I like that Ring Nebula is in um, Lyra because yeah, the the ringing of the notes is kind of fun. Let's see. Oh no. Okay, I've rambled too long. Um, <laughs> I guess yeah. Pluto is a <laughs> really. <All right. clears throat> Pluto is a planet. It's a dwarf planet, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> nerds. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting so much um, death stares from producers right now. <laughs> anyway, um, let's let's take a look at some other cool stuff. So, uh, ooh, yeah. Let's see. So here. I've got the Trifids pulled up, or Trifid Nebula pulled up. It's um, in Sagittarius, um, southern sky. You can probably find it um, with without too much trouble with a, a telescope of some kind. Um, it's big. Yeah, but it's it's somewhere in the teapot, I believe, of... Oh, actually, that might be right there. Boink. Um, but it's in the, in the teapot in the Milky Way, uh, and Trifids is a, is a fun one. Um, it's... What is it? Uh... It is a star-forming region. It's also an emission nebula. It's also an absorption nebula. Uh, it's also another cool nebula. Uh, so, like, 
I think in the story of stars, like if you think about like the life cycle of a star, these sort of um, stellar nurseries play a very important part, right? <clears throat> in that they are the hydrogen that forms the stars. But also, if you have a bunch of hydrogen floating around and helium or whatever, whatever's left from some other reaction, um, if you have an event like the Dumbbell Nebula or the Ring Nebula, where a star um, dies and kind of gives off all the elements that it, it created throughout its life and some other cool ones um, that it creates in that last little pop um, before it spreads out, and then the hyperheated uh, sphere of, of pure carbon rockets through the universe, um, which we don't talk about, I guess. Uh, but there, that's the kind of stuff that should keep you up at night. White dwarves just flying around. Anyway, um, so like in this type of nebula, if you have gases hanging out, when other gases, when other elements sort of like bump into it, it's no longer vacuum, right? So it's going to slow them down. It's going to kind of stop um, these other elements in there. And when a star forms from the gravitational attraction of all the hydrogen, right? It just hydrogen atoms fall into other hydrogen atoms and uh, enough piles on. But it's not preferentially hydrogen. It's, it's just whatever's around. And so now they've got um, heavier elements that they don't have to fuse anymore being incorporated into the stellar mix, into the little uh, the, the batter that makes the, the new star right um little little like sprinkles in the cake right it's like a fun fetty cake uh and um it gives that star uh, a kind of a leg up on what it can do and what it can make and it's like this nice inheritance from you know you've got uh, a star that has had to die to give off to make those elements and then pass them on to the next generation of star and next generation of star and next generation of star which i think is neat um oh we've got like 18 minutes left in the stream. Okay. I'm gonna show like three more pictures. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then, then I swear I'll, I'll stop talking and, and let y'all. Um, uh, can I pull up and show an image of any comet? Um, producer, can you figure out a way to get me a picture of a comet to throw on the stream? We'll work on it. Um, We'll work on that, and I'll figure out eventually how to get set up. Or could you put um, K2 in the Instagram or like in the Discord or something? Yay. Okay. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, yeah. Speaking about the lives of stars, let's go, let's go bigger, bigger, more meta for a second. Um, this is Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, Whirlpool Galaxy is up in uh, Ursa Major. Um, boop, 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 which it's just off the map right now. It's below its tail. Um, the story of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor are sort of uh, the stories of these people that were turned into bears because the gods are weird and um, grabbed them by the tails and like bolo whipped them around and hucked them in the night sky for their catastrophism. So they basically got stuck up there uh, and um, spread out into the stars. But uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy is uh, a, a galactic cannibal uh, or a, a cannibalistic galaxy event, right? So you've got the smaller one, and you can see like the stars and stellar uh, materials being siphoned off into the big one, right? Um, and incorporated, and it's called galactic cannibalism. And they, it's actually a pretty peaceful process. We don't really see a lot of like impacting, and it's it's because of a couple reasons. Um, one is sort of like this way that stars will kind of make way for other stars uh, just due to sort of this gravitational pull. Um, but space is a lot of empty space, and so it's it's really rare for stuff to just bump into each other out there. But also, um, when it siphons it off, they're sort of um, keeping this preferred or direction, right? So, you know, if you're all driving the same way on the highway, you're not going to have a head-on collision, which is the crazy one, right? You, so maybe you'd get like a fender bender, like a little, like a, 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 a you know, backing into someone. Um, and so because they're all kind of being incorporated the same way, uh, it's, it's very, very rare for any collisions to happen. But it's still called galactic cannibalism, and that's cool. Um, so uh, I like it because it's a whirlpool. It's a little, little galaxy like the Ursa Minor. Um, it's a bigger galaxy like Ursa Major. And it kind of looks like a vortex being made by a spinning bear tail as it's hooked into the night sky by a, 
um, a very jealous god. Uh, let's see. You just put it in the chat. Okay. Um, we've got. Um... Oh yeah. K two is up there. Uh, so we just put it in the chat. Um, Cody just put it in there. Uh, you can see like the coma surrounding it. Um, that's kind of like that. Yeah, the fuzzy cloud around it is a coma. Um, I think coma means uh, hair or something like that. Um, so it's the comet's hair. And yeah, just beyond Saturn's orbit. It looks super pretty. Oh, they're asking stuff. Asking for a photo of Mars. Do you have a photo of Mars? <laughs> I don't know how to find these fast enough. Mm -mm -mm. Let me find a picture of Mars for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I were Mars, where would I be? Some pictures of Mars taken with the mountain cam. Unfortunately, I don't know how to get to them. Um, so I'm going to pop back over to Selena right now for a second while I fiddle with it um, and see what I can find. smartest man alive. So this is what Mars looks like through the Malin cam. Um, you know, it's it's tough to see. Um, but you can see some of the sort of like uh, basin features, right? Um, and you can just make out a little a little wisp of a cap on the top um, if you look real hard. Uh, yeah, it's, it's tough getting, getting Mars uh, in a decent view with sort of terrestrial stuff that, that we've got. Um, hmm? What? Oh. oh, yeah, we are going back to the moon um, with the Artemis launch. Uh, so maybe I'll pop up the moon and I'll probably um, ramble for a bit about that because I love the moon. Let's see. I have to do that weird thing again, though where I uh, pop you back up to Selena for a second. Let's grab the moon. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's glorious. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, pals, I love the moon so much. Um, as a rock nerd and a space nerd, it's perfect. Um, yeah, the Artemis mission is, is going up there. Um, obviously not this part of the moon. We can't see the part of the moon that they're going to. I believe they're going to the dark side, southern pole kind of area. Um, but we can see some fun basins and fun craters. You can definitely see how um, people, uh, you know, for a long, long time thought that the moon was uh, volcanic kind of features, like a lot of these craters. 
um, you know, like the little one out down on the lower left uh, has like a little resurgent peak, you know, from basically something getting hit so hard that uh, it kind of like makes the ground ripple and then kind of prop up. Um, and uh, some fun, beautiful, beautiful basins, the beautiful Mar, um, obviously um, uh, uh, Copernicus crater up there and um, little, some cool ray ejecta coming off of it. But I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the moon. Um, Earth's little kid that kind of got blasted off during the Hadean time period by, by that big old Mars-sized thingy called Theia. Kind of like why Earth had rings for a while. Um, I could ramble for a billion years about about the moon. Um, I love the sort of the, the lunar highlands, kind of the white part, and how they make little cool island chains and things like that in the Mar. Uh, and Mar like literally means sea. Oh yeah, Earth had, Earth had rings. Um, basically, Hadean time period, Earth is just made of made of lava, um, and it got sideswiped by a big old object, and it sprayed all that stuff into the sky, and it would have been yeah, it would have been rings for a while, rings of molten um, basalt basically, and uh, eventually they would um, condense and come together, uh, and form the moon, and the moon was was liquidy for a super long time too, just because. I mean, it's in space, so it's a vacuum, and that's the best thermos ever for keeping things hot. So it stayed hot and um, slowly, slowly cooled down, and we, we, we can see a lot of like um, Earth's history in it, in the cooling process, and in um, the elements and minerals that make up the moon. Um, you know, it's mostly uh, basalt and anorthite, which is kind of fun. But yeah, I know it definitely took a beating. Um, late heavy bombardment, smacked this thing all crazy um especially with like sort of the lunar tilt right now um as it gets farther and farther away from us there's less wiggle in the moon's um sort of orbit like uh right now it kind of it kind of wobbles towards us it doesn't stay perfectly locked right but eventually it'll be like super tightly locked and then uh at that point then the back side of the moon the dark the radio dark side of the moon is really gonna take the brunt of things um but before, you know, it would get a fair amount of impacts on the front. But the back looks like pumice. Everyone first, everyone's like, "Oh, the back's probably really smooth." No, it looks crazy. Um, it's really beaten up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks just like a giant pile of white pumice because it's mostly anorthite surface. You don't have the mar, um, and that's because there's sort of an offset core to the moon that's facing us, and that's bits of like the mantle kind of like leaking out through impact basins and things like that, kind of springing up like an artesian well of lava was neat um people are asking for some uh eagle nebula uh and that might be a fun a fun thing to kind of cap the night on um let me see where i can find <laughs> i hope you all are having fun hanging out with me tonight um i'm definitely enjoying chatting and being able to ramble about all my favorite things um Besides brown paper packages tied up with string, uh, I also enjoy space stuff as a few of my favorite things. Um, people are mad at me about that. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, there we go. bad piece of bad ac back acne no it was just beaten up by it basically so earth you know very very large right you can attract a lot of things in space um and the moon took the beating for it so earth is like the one starting the stuff and then you know like starting a fight and then basically saying like moon you know take care of it for me um uh, let's see what i got I'm going to pop Stelina back on for a second and then I'll find um, I'll find Eagle Nebula for you uh, to kind of cap the night oh is the moon's core molten at all I I believe it's a semi-molten core right now I'm really not sure I, I believe there's still quite a bit of debate on it um, we know that it has somewhat of a solid core but the seismic surveys they did way back in the day weren't like the best, you know? Um, uh, 
I, I, I feel like it, it's got something of a, of a liquid core, but don't quote me on it. I mean, I guess you can. I'm technically on the chat right now, but um, maybe like, just please don't. Uh, let's see. Where are you, Eagle? Oop, there we go. Um, no, I, I believe that the wobbling will slowly... Um, uh, make up. The, the wobbling will eventually stabilize as it reaches its furthest point. So um, the, moon, the moon is definitely moving away from us, right? Um, you know, pr pretty steadily. <clears throat> and <clears throat> at some point, it will be permanently tidally locked. And it'll be locked in place um, when it gets up to its farthest point. Um, that wobbling motion is part of sort of like an energy loss. Um, and it's due to a bunch of things like tides and things like that. Um, and just general, it's moving around, and so the energy's got to go somewhere. But uh, as it moves further and further away, it will become more and more tightly locked, uh, and that's part of that sort of it reaching an equilibrium with Earth. So, um, yeah, I don't. It maybe it might have more wobble in the short run, but um, I think in the long run, it's meant to just flat out stabilize. Oh, I got Eagle Nebula up uh, now. It's beautiful. Um, let's see. Uh, question. Uh, the new Madrid quake. I'm not sure. Um, what what's going on with the um, uh, comets with that? Um, the new isn't the new Madrid quake system like m like Midwest kind of area. But I've got the I've got the Eagle Nebula up for you. You can see it's a little little beautiful um, nebulous region up in the the upper left from your view. Um, she's a beaut, uh, and this was this was obviously taken with um, the Malincam here here at Lowell, and I believe this was taken on an interactive stargazing um, a while ago. Uh, so um, uh, the red and black background is stellar dust or hydrogen, I believe. Um, Hydrogen. Well, anything that's really illuminated right now is is hydrogen. You've got sort of these dark nebulous regions, and those tend to be darker materials. Um, and then realistically, for anything to glow, it needs to be um, energized by something, and it's usually stars um, being born nearby or a cluster nearby. I'm not too versed on Eagle Nebula, to be honest. Um, but uh, it's beautiful, right? Uh, so I think, you know, we're, we're kind of coming to the tail end. I hope everyone had fun with me. Um, uh, yeah, listen to Star Stuff podcast with um, any of the ones with me, John Compton, on it. Um, the rest are fine, but uh, I'm kidding. They're great. Um, but, yeah, uh, ask me tons of questions in the Discord. Uh, correct me on anything that I got wrong. Um, I'm actually me. Uh, I'll give you – you'll get a prize um, of nothing. Uh, you win nothing. Except the pride and glory to know that you you bested someone, and, and that that someone was me, John Compton. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like let's let's hang out and do fun stuff. Um, I, I love this. I love these things. Never ended up getting to Andromeda Galaxy in the in the um, view, but uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like eventually, Andromeda is going to merge with uh, the Milky Way will be cannibalized like, like with Milky Way or like with, um, Whirlpool Nebula. And, um, I, I would suggest to everyone in the chat, um, get in the discord, come up with a better name than Milk Dromeda, which is what they're currently calling when Andromeda merges with the Milky Way. That's disgusting. Um, it sounds like, uh, like a beverage made of milk and gummy bears. Um, uh, gross. So <laughs> come up with a better name than Milk Dromeda. Um, let me know in the in the comments and uh, let me know in the Discord what you think and maybe um, if it's a if it's a super cool sounding name, uh, dive into some old mythology or something fun, and um, I'll shout you out on the podcast next time I'm on. But yeah, thanks for hanging out, you nerds. Andrew away. Mm. We can do, we can, we can give a decent, you know, uh, I'll give you three out of five. I don't know. Um, 
the drama llama <gasps> that's pretty good um that's that's pretty good <laughs> um you know because like okay so andromeda was the princess um that was about to be uh, eaten by um cetus the sea monster right and was basically picked up by pegasus uh and saved so andromeda galaxy is named after uh the andromeda constellation which is named after that princess right so you know and then the milky way that's like the bifrost right um so like what's a princess freya you know like what's a princess in in like a norse mythology or something cool like that or candy bars Pr princess pr princess gross candy bar <laughs> i don't know huh Oh, sorry. Um, it looks like we're out of time, so um, I'm going to go drink the rest of this coffee before going to bed. Um, thanks for staying up late with me. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be doing these a little bit uh, earlier, just because we, we start it when we close for the night, all right? And during the summer we're at 11 o'clock close, but soon we'll be closing at 10, and uh, we can hang out for, yeah, a little bit more. Okay. Bye, nerds! <laughs>